Okay, so up to this point in AUC Section 240, we have um, gathered information from management about and uh, those charged with governance and others within the entity regarding their uh, policies for mitigating fraud in the company. Uh, we've also used that information to assess the risk of material misstatement due to fraud in the company. And then we also um, discussed developing procedures to respond to those risks um, at the financial statement level and at the assertion level. And so now we're going to dive into developing audit procedures responsive to risk related related to management override of controls. And, and this means that uh, management's in a unique position to perpetrate fraud um, because they have the ability to manipulate the accounting records and prepare fraudulent financial statements by overriding the controls um, that are otherwise operating effectively if they hadn't overridden them. And since this happening is, is very unpredictable or different ways that they could do it is unpredictable, uh, we call this um, a risk of material misstatement due to fraud. And so it's a significant risk. And there's different levels of risk for management override of controls at different entities. Um, but it's nevertheless present in, in all entities. And so every audit that we do, we should list this uh, management override of controls as a fraud and significant risk. And therefore, we need to address this risk of management override of controls uh, specifically in our audit. And several ways to do that are listed here in this AUC section 240.31 or er, .32. Um, one way that we could respond to that risk is by testing journal entries. And those might include journal entries that are recorded in the journal ledger, um, other adjustments made in the preparation of financial statements. Uh, so, for instance, maybe consolidating entries or um, or entries that are made directly to the financial statement drafts. So rather than making an actual journal entry in the trial balance, uh, they just add or subtract numbers within the financial statements. And so if we're going to test the appropriateness of journal entries, uh, we need to follow these steps here. And the first one is to obtain an understanding of the entity's financial reporting process and their controls around journal entries and other adjustments. Then we need to make inquiries of individuals involved in the financial reporting process. And we need to ask them if there's anything um, inappropriate or unusual that's happening and related to these journal entries. We also need to consider fraud risk indicators. So that would be the nature and complexity of accounts and entries processed outside the normal course of business. So if we see some more complex accounts or um, adjustments that were made, say on, on Sunday evening or something, that would alert us to uh, a higher risk of fraud possibly. We also need to select journal entries and other adjustments made at the end of the reporting period. Um, so we might make a selection of uh, journal entries that appear unusual. For instance, um, they're debiting or crediting accounts in a way that are, are not common or uh, big round numbers. Um, journal entries made outside the normal uh, time period of business, so maybe late at nine or something like that. Um, and we also need to consider the need to test journal entries and other adjustments throughout the period. So we might consider this not only at the end of the reporting period, um, but also maybe throughout the year as well. Um, and like everything else in the audit, this is based on our professional judgment. So another thing we might do to address the risk of material or uh, management override of controls might be to review accounting estimates for biases and to evaluate whether the circumstances producing the bias, if any, uh, represent a risk of material misstatement due to fraud. So we might look at our uh, most sensitive estimates and see, do these estimates make sense? So for instance, the fair value of, of level three investments or maybe the allowance uh, for, uh, or rather the contractual allowance for medical companies or something, something that's a, a big um, estimate that's very subjective. So in, in order to perform that review, we might evaluate whether the judgments and decisions made by management indicate a possible bias on the part of the management, and that might represent a risk of material misstatement due to fraud. And if it looks like that risk might be justified, then we should reevaluate the accounting estimates taken as a whole. Um, another way to perform the review of estimates is to perform a retrospective review of management judgments and assumptions related to significant accounting estimates. So using that example of the contractual allowance for medical companies, uh, we might look at the prior year's financial statements and see how much did um, the entity actually collect from insurance companies or, or so and find out was their estimate last year uh, close to the way that it really turned out. And so another way that we might address the risk of management override of controls might be to evaluate for significant transactions that are outside the normal course of business for the entity or that otherwise appear to be unusual. So then we might determine was there a normal business rationale for having that transaction or was that transaction just used to engage in fraudulent financial reporting or to conceal misappropriation of assets? So uh, this could piggyback off of our review of journal entries that we have here. Um, so to summarize, um, the risk of management override of controls is uh, present in all entities that we audit, and we need to take these particular steps to uh, lower our audit risk to a reasonable level that there's no risk of material misstatement due to fraud. Um, and we also see here that uh, if there are other specific risks, we need to perform additional procedures to address those risks. So we have a lot of explanatory material here. Um, 
going all the way up to 855. So about 847 to 855, we have some explanatory material to help us uh, to respond to the risk of management override control. So let's go down to the explanatory material. Okay, so now we're down in explanatory material. Uh, we're first going to discuss the journal entries and other adjustments. And we remember from the requirements that uh, we're supposed to select some journal entries or review journal entries that look unusual um, or that uh, happen at, at certain times that are outside the normal course of business, that sort of thing. So, and here they give us a reason why. And it says that material misstatements of financial statements due to fraud often involve the manipulation of the financial reporting process by recording inappropriate or unauthorized journal entries throughout the year or the period end. Um, the material misstatements of financial statements do also often revolve, involve the manipulation of financial reporting process by making adjustments to amounts reported in the financial statements that are not reflected in formal journal entries, such as through consolidating adjustments, report combinations, and reclassification. So uh, we not only need to look at the journal entries and the journal ledger, we also need to look at any adjustments they made outside of the um, journal ledger and producing the financial statements because uh, companies don't typically record every uh, adjustment in the general ledger or trial balance um, when they're consolidating um, companies, they usually have a consolidating schedule. Um, maybe they reclassify some of the long-term debt to um, the current debt, and they might not do that within the actual trial balance. It may just be through a schedule that gets to the financial statements. So we need to be on the lookout for those types of entries too, and, um, and uh, review them for any bias or manipulation. And so the biggest reason why we are um, assessing and responding to the risk of management override of controls is that uh, in our audit, we might um, do all of our, our tests for appropriateness of uh, transactions and cr controls and processes, for instance, automated processes, like if the point, uh, automated point of sale process um, computer uh, automatically records the revenue for different transactions and it works out well, but what if uh, management comes in later and just makes an adjustment to it that's not justified within uh, the general ledger. So we need to be on, uh, aware of those types of things that might circumvent the IT controls that we had previously determined were, were working well. And so when we are identifying and selecting journal entries to test, as well as the, the other adjustments outside of the general ledger, we might look at the following list of items uh, when we're reviewing those particular journal entries and determining which ones we want to select to test. And uh, that might depend on our assessment of risk of material mistake due to fraud. Um, so if we assess particular types of transactions to be more risky, we might select those. We might also consider uh, the controls that have been implemented over journal entries. So effective controls um, would reduce the extent of substantive testing that's required of us. The entity's financial reporting process and the nature of evidence that can be obtained. So there'll be a lot of um, possibly uh, journal entries and adjustments um, that have components of being both automated and manual. So we might, might need to understand both of those uh, processes to determine which of uh, the journal entries are more risky than the others. Uh, maybe the manual uh, journal entry is more prone to error or mistake, um, but we would also need to consider are the automated controls and procedures um, appropriate. And next, we also need to cons consider the characteristics of fraudulent journal entries or the other adjustment. So we might select uh, journal entries that look unusual and characteristics of unusual journal entries might be those that are made to unrelated or unusual or seldom used accounts, uh, like the debit or credit, um, an odd combination of accounts. Uh, maybe they're made by individuals who typically don't make journal entries um, at the entity. Uh, maybe they're recorded at the end of the period or post-closing. Maybe they're made um, either before or during preparation of the financial statements and they don't have account numbers. Or maybe they contain round numbers or consistent ending numbers. So we might select these types or journal entries with these characteristics um, that would maybe have a higher risk of fraud or management overrider controls. Next, we might also consider the nature and complexity of it. So we might select uh, journal entries that contain transactions that are complex or unusual in nature, ones that contain significant estimates and period end adjustments. Ones that have been prone to misstatements in the past, um, ones that have been not been reconciled on a timely basis, or contain unreconciled differences, ones that contain intercompany transactions, or ones that are otherwise associated with identified risk of material misstatement due to fraud. So these types of accounts might be more complex and more prone to um, errors or fraud. And we can consider a lot of different uh, locations or components as well in that selection. So finally, we might consider looking at journal entries or other adjustments that are processed outside the normal course of business. So um, non-standard journal entries, and other entries such as consolidating adjustments may not be subject to the same level of internal control as those journal entries used on a recurring basis to record transactions, such as monthly sales purchases and cash disbursements. So uh, journal entries or adjustments that aren't made to the general ledger are usually kind of ad hoc adjustments or um, there's not usually a particular control in place to make sure that those journal entries are, are recorded accurately uh, because it's, it's not um, a common entry to make. So uh, we need to pay close attention to those types of entries as well. And finally, as we've seen in, in nearly a, every AUC section, we're using our professional judgment to determine the nature, timing, and extent of our um, testing of the journal entries. 
but um, we also have to follow the requirements um, of this AUC section and that requires us to select journal entries made at the end of the period. And we also need to consider whether uh, we need to select any during the period because uh, fraud could also be accomplished during the period um, rather than just at the end of the period. So uh, we just need to consider where we, whether we need to do that or not. Next, we're coming to uh, accounting estimates. Remember from uh, the requirement above at 32B, we, uh, we want to hone in on the accounts that require very subjective or complex estimates. And of course, that's because it's, it's pretty easy to manipulate the estimates in order to maybe smooth earnings um, to make revenues or expenses higher um, as you see fit. And that's why we need, really need to hone in on our risk there related to accounting estimates. Um, and one of the ways to do that that we saw up in the requirements is to perform a retrospective review of management's judgments and assumptions related to the amount of those estimates that are reflected in the financial statements uh, of the prior year. And so as we explained, we might look back at the prior year and see did uh, the results of that estimate actually come to be true or, or pretty close? And if not, was, is that caused by a bias, bias on management's part? It's not necessarily for us to look back and see were our judgments appropriate. It's for us to look back and see were management's judgments appropriate. And in doing so, we might be able to tell if uh, management is biased this year as well. And that retrospective review is also required in AUC Section 540 as a risk assessment procedure. And they wanted to see if management was effective in prior year at estimating um, the balance that they're trying to estimate. And that would be able to tell us uh, for the current year um, how accurate our estimate might be if we're using the same estimation process that uh, management used in prior year. And finally, in review of our uh, journal entries, we want to look at the business rationale for significant transactions. If there's not uh, a business rationale for that transaction, it might be indicative of, um, of risk of fraud. And so transactions that are outside the normal course of business um, or that kind of appear unusual for this type of entity uh, might be indicative of fraudulent finance reporting or a way to conceal misappropriation of assets. And uh, some examples of how um, we might identify those transactions would be transactions that appear overly complex. For example, it involves several entities, um, a consolidated group or multiple unrelated third parties. So trying to make it so complex, it's hard to understand uh, what's happening there. Um, another thing that might uh, signify to us um, an unusual transaction might be that uh, the board wasn't told about it or didn't approve of the transaction. So maybe it was done without approval. Um, management is trying to place more emphasis on the need for a particular accounting treatment rather than underlying economics of the transaction. So um, they're looking at form over substance. Next might be transactions that involve non-consolidated related parties, um, included, including special purpose entities that have not been properly reviewed or approved by those charged with governance. So um, maybe money's being paid to those related parties um, that the board isn't aware of or didn't approve of. And finally, uh, transactions that involve previously unidentified related parties. So all of these um, different types of transactions might be outside the normal course of business um, and unusual for the entity and might um, have a higher risk for uh, fraudulent finance reporting or concealing misappropriation of assets. And as we've discussed before, um, the risk of material misstatement um, due to fraud can't be reduced to an appropriate low, low level by performing only tests of controls. And that's because throughout this whole section, what we talked about, uh, man the risk of management override of control. So even if we have uh, great controls um, at the financial statement and the assertion level, there's always that risk that management can override those controls. So there's never a way that we can reduce the risk to appropriately low level um, just by performing tested controls. That's why we have to go through all of these steps here um, to uh, assess the risk of management override controls.